Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I am so pleased to welcome you to the second week of a two-part series on travels through Italy. Uh, last week we had a wonderful time uh, with our guests talking about Rome, Italy, and they had 80 wonderful uh, slides that they showed us and talked about what uh, they experienced on that particular travel. Uh, they went to Rome, Italy and stayed there April 12th through the 19th in 2006, and the program we're going to do today, they travel from April 20th through May the 3rd in cities such as Florence and Venice, Italy. I welcome to the program two of my very good friends. First of all is Andy Finney, and you've not seen him much before, but he is vital to this program. He's our executive producer behind the scenes, and Andy, I want to take this opportunity to thank you again. You're an incredible supporter of what we do, and, and you're so professional. We thank you so much, and thanks for doing these two programs with your spouse. Uh, we you, appreciate it very much. And I'm equally pleased to welcome Roxanne Finney. Uh, she does home care uh, work, or home care assistant with the elderly, and she is, like her husband, a world traveler. Uh, welcome back, and we look forward to uh, all these great visuals of your trip to other parts of Italy. And I also welcome our regular panel, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Erna Reinhardt, who's the director of public relations at North Idaho College. And I think we'll do as we did last week, Andy. We'll start with, um, <coughs> you, amazing how you get through all of those in such a, uh, a reasonable amount of time. So take us, and Roxanne will participate too, take us through such cities as Florence and Venice in the first part of our program. Thank you, Tony. Uh, after we left Rome, uh, which we had an apartment in, um, we were on our own for a week. And so we rented a car uh, and then took off. And so after we left Rome, we got on a train, went to Florence, picked up our car, and started touring around. So our first slide is the Duomo in Florence, uh, which is a pretty spectacular building. It's made out of three different colors of marble, uh, red, green, and white. Uh, primarily green, though, a little red for accents. Uh, but as we go through these, the inside is just spectacular. I mean, it's 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 done in a the Baroque period, but it's also sometimes too much. I mean, you're, you're going to find some things. Some things that you look at are just overwhelming because there's yeah, just so overwhelming. much detail. Yeah, overwhelming. It's a good. And you notice in in here there were uh, the walls are a little bit um, been painted over the years from the candles and all the different things. So when we were there, they were in there. Um, it smelled like some type of a pine type cleaner that they were cleaning the walls. And Florence has 420,000 some people there. So they have areas in town that they don't let any traffic into trying to cut down on the smog for the buildings and stuff. So it's yeah. and that's important to know when you're in a car is if you're driving and you see a sign that says traffic limited, don't go past it in your car because it means about a hundred euro fine on your rental car when you return it every infraction. And so. Florence has cameras in the downtown area where you're not supposed to be, so if the police will find out about it. <laughs> so you just kind of watch where you're going and ask directions. The artwork and the ceilings of a lot of these churches and facilities you go to are just phenomenal. I mean, it has taken centuries for them to gather all this artwork, but they've primarily put it up in the ceiling to protect it, keep it from you know, thieves' hands. Um, and some of these murals, the, art, the artwork is real spectacular. The, during the particular time periods in which the, the art was developing, these archways are actually painted. The arches themselves and the pictures behind them are, are perfect perspective uh, to kind of give you the impression that you're looking through a natural archway into another room. Um, of course, there's the, the oversized bottle of Chianti, which is just all over the place in Italy. I wanted to bring one home, but I couldn't get it on the airplane. It's too big. <laughs> Um, here's another exterior picture of the Duomo, and you'll see to the left the bell tower has been cleaned, and the building to the right has not yet had its treatment done yet. So there, there's a lot of pollution that they're trying to clean off these buildings to restore them back to their original luster again. How old, Andy, was that building, would you say? Oh, that Duomo is centuries old, probably 12th century, thereabouts, when it was built. Wow. Uh, busy streets. Um, this is just a common street. You see all the mopeds and the... the, the one lane for the car, as well as just a small sidewalk for people. Yeah, the so it gets sidewalks rather crowded. are quite small. You, a lot of times you cannot pass two people. You know, you kind of have to go sideways. You have to step sideways to get by. Um, and just, th there's artwork there that, that's just in the middle of the street. There's two statues along the side of a building that the road just goes right by because they have so much artwork, they put it wherever they can. Um, this is uh, the Uffizi. 
uh, museum, and this is just right out front. The upper stories of the building you see behind you know, on the background there, each floor you kind of walk around in a, in a clockwise manner, and you go one floor at a time until you've experienced the whole museum. There's, but out front there's artists. Yeah, there must and, be thousands of marble statues and, oh, and the Caesars and thousands of paintings. I mean, it, it was intake overload when we were going through there, and this was in Florence. Um, and then we also went through like the academia later. Um, a good point on Uffizi Gallery and the academia, call from the United States, make your reservations, because then you have like a 10 minute wait versus... 10 hours sometimes. Yeah. The, the lines get rather large. Very large. Um, we've got Leonardo da Vinci, who was of course uh, a big influence on a lot of the art and uh, the mechanics of, of Italy. Uh, his, you'll find his likeness everywhere. Um, this is the one of the main rivers that run through Florence, and I can't for the life of me remember the name of the river. Um, I was thinking it. I'm not sure of the pronunciation if it's the Arno. Or might Arno. be the Arno River. Yeah, yeah. that sounds right. No, um, Ponte Vecchio. There's only a few bridges that cross because, and, and their bridges are very wide because they only have just a few of them. But um, you'll see them grace the countryside because they actually try to make them blend as best they can into the the scenery around it. Um, this is some of the gold shops on the Ponte Vecchio Bridge uh, in, in Florence. And this apparently is where the best gold prices are in all of Europe. So if you're going to buy some jewelry, buy it off the Ponte Vecchio when you're in Florence. Um, here we are in Siena, and this is uh, Il Campo, or the center of the town. And there's just, it's where people gather. There are no beaches or parks to lay out in. It's just these town squares. And so people gather and sit and listen to music and just watch life go by. Well, as we leave uh, Florence and Siena, we get in our car and start driving, and the scenery is just phenomenal. I mean, if you've seen pictures of the, t of the countryside from Italy at all, you'll, you'll begin to appreciate a few of the scenes that you're going to see. Because it just, the rolling hills, the, well, actually, here, here's a, a picture of a, a fixer-upper. Um, the, the way the building laws are in Italy, you can't build a new structure, but you can restore an old one, and you have to restore it to the way it was when it was built centuries ago. So this is truly a fixer-upper. If you want to buy a house Tuscany, in the country, country, this is what you would buy, and then you'd fix that up. Yeah, throughout Tuscany, you you don't see a brand new house. I mean, we asked the uh, in Montese, we asked the guy where we stayed at the hotel, and I said, "How old? What's probably the newest?" And he said, "420 years old would be yeah. probably your newest home." And this this slide here is the town of Montese, and to the right is a granary, which was they figure initially built around 400. So this is a really, really old building that they've constantly been reworking and, and, and restoring throughout the years. While we stayed in Montesi, one of the things that we did for ourselves, because it was our 10th anniversary, that was part of the reason why we took this trip, was our 10th wedding anniversary, but we treated ourselves to a balloon ride. Uh, if you really want to see the countryside, spend a little extra dollars, find this local pilot someplace out there and go for a balloon ride. This particular pilot was from England, uh, had moved to Italy and, and uh, was giving balloon tours uh, all over Tuscany and Umbria. And as we're inflating the balloon, he goes inside and straightens out, of course, all the guidelines so that we can have a nice, safe flight. That would be important. <laughs> it, it is. And a few minutes later, a little puff of the gas, and away you go. Uh, and you get to see some of the beautiful sceneries. So this you, is, took, you took some pictures from that balloon. We yes. did. And this is our pilot's house. This is what he's fixing up. You can see his garage in the bottom right still doesn't have a roof because he's still trying to restore it. He's working on the house. And it was neat flying with him because he knew the history of these little hilltop towns and was telling us, you know, he'd point to various places and you'd look off. Now, this over into here is um, off towards Florence and Siena. and Siena. He says they're always in the fog usually. That's why he likes to be further into Tuscany where he, and we zoomed in on this because we were quite a ways quite away a ways from away. that. But the important point he made was that all the hilltop towns in Italy are hilltop towns for a reason. Um, when you wanted to see the Etruscans coming, the best view was from the highest vantage point you could find. And they had a, a system of signaling each other from one town to the next, that when the Etruscans were coming, they would light bonfires or do other things to alert the next town that the Etruscans were on their way and to prepare. And a lot of them are little citadel cities that are with a wall around them. And it was just the neatest thing to get to see the various ones and participate. And of course, here's your typical balloon shot that shows, yeah, you're in the air and there's your shadow of you on the ground. So, But these little farmhouses, that, again, they're centuries old. There's no new structures out there. They're all ancient structures that have been restored. But the countryside is just 
It's just breathtaking. This morning on our flight, it was just a beautiful day outside. And Andy, uh, how are most of those people employed? What, what are they doing to make a living, other than your balloon um, driver, of course? <laughs> pretty much every farm, if you will, in Italy has olive trees and has some sort of vineyards. And from those, they eke out their living. You have local markets nearby, you have local food stores and vegetable stands, and so that's where most of their wares are sold and how they provide for themselves. Well, they have, over there, have trades. I mean, in the United States, we've kind of gotten away from trades. Over there, like when you're refurbishing your house, putting it back to the way it was, you have to hire one of the local masonaries to come in and do that. So there's a lot of trades that everybody still does. And, and required by a lot of uphold. So. Yeah. But when you're traveling, um, you, you've seen these small European cars. Um, you're not locked into these little cars. That little motor scooter sitting behind that car has a larger wheelbase than the car itself. <laughs> and don't feel trapped into these things because despite the fact that they get good gas mileage and that they're convenient, <laughs> you can actually rent something that's a little more comfortable for Americans. This was a car that we, we drove while we were there. This is a Renault Magain. Nice little two-seater. Um, we got the convertible because we really wanted to experience the countryside. So with the top-down driving in the back roads, it really was an unforgettable experience for us. And as you drive through and get off the beaten path in these small little towns, um, you really get to see true Italy. Um, people hang the laundry outside. Uh, they don't have dryers, partly because electric is expensive. Um, and these little byways and walkways, you know, if you're on a tour bus, you're never going to see them. Of course, some wine country. Now, here we are arriving in Assisi, uh, and this, this is down in the, the, uh, the new part of Assisi, down off the mountain. This particular church is the church of... Uh, I mean, it's the Basilica of St. Anne. Or Basilica of St. Anne. Um, this church, or this basilica, was built over top of the original church that St. Francis um, heard God speak to him and say, rebuild my church. And so inside of this one is this little tiny church. Probably seats about a dozen people inside. That's all the bigger it is. It's very small, but it's also very old. I mean, this was back into the 1200s, if not earlier. During um, Francis of Assisi. Yeah, during Francis of Assisi's main. Uh, of course, Assisi is in Umbria, so we're in Umbria. Now, the, the original town of Assisi is there on the top of the hill. Uh, the big structure to the left, which we'll get a better view in the next picture um, coming up, is actually the, the, the Basilica of St. Francis. Uh, it's a huge basilica. Uh, in 1998, when they had the earthquake in Italy, um, they had all the frescoes fall off of the ceiling of one of the, the chapels in there. It was in this basilica that that occurred, and since then they've done their best to restore them and get them all back on the ceiling. And here's the Basilica of St. Francis. Um, it's a huge facility. It's still an active monastery. And as you're getting out again after dark, um, you get some just fantastic pictures, but in a hill town, You'll notice that it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but those are all staircases. Staircases take you up and down because the roads are, well, just too steep to walk for the most part. One of the things we enjoyed, too, was evening walks. We found that when we were over in Italy, we end up, you know, during siesta time, a lot of times we'd take breaks because they're taking breaks or maybe still go travel. But then into the evenings, that's when the Italians get out and do their walks, um, the evening walks. And so you'd get to see different people in the town and the kids come out. So it's very enjoyable. That's when Italy really comes alive is in the evening. Is after dinner, they come out and they go for their walks, do their shopping late at night. Um, instead of driving to the grocery store, they walk. So, as we left Assisi, we ended up going to a town of Cortona, which if you've uh, read the book or seen the movie Under the Tuscan Sun, this is where Francis Mays has their summer home, uh, is in this town. Uh, we didn't have a hotel set up for Cortona, but we ended up actually staying in a monastery or staying in a convent, which was much more affordable than actually staying in a hotel, about a third of the price. This is in uh, Siena again, um, as we're getting ready to head out toward Venice. Um, this is Porta Roma, which is one of the old gates of the city where they protected from invaders. They have arrow slots in the front and things to ward off would be intruders. This is back in Siena in Il Campo, the center square. This is, happens to be April 26th, which is... Or 25th. Or 25th, yes. which is Italy's Independence Day. So it's like our 4th of July. And they had lots of dignitaries come down to the center square and give many speeches, um, some cheering and some booing from the crowd. And, and although we didn't understand Italian very well, we figured they were going through and recounting their history of communism into their <laughs> democratic party or society that they have today. Um, here we are in Venice. Um, a short train ride later, 
we have an apartment in Venice, so we're able to base out of here and tour the island. This uh, is the Grand Canal. This is the Grand Canal, which is rather busy every day. Um, you've got gondolas, little speed boats to vaporettos, which are basically the city buses that come by and pick people up. And everything is brought in by boat. Um, there are no motor vehicles in Venice, no scooters. Everything's on a hand truck that is propelled by a human being. Um, here's a floating vegetable stand that pulls up to the side of the curb, ties up, and you come in to buy your groceries and your vegetables. Here's a typical street or canal in Venice, just populated with all the local boats. And it's a very colorful island uh, out there. There's just so many things to see, and just if you take the time to, to look around, you'll see things. Just outside of our apartment, this was our front door. If you weren't careful, you'd get your feet wet because the motorboats would go by and splash water upon your feet. Again, here's the Grand Canal again and the Rialto Bridge. Um, that's a Vaporetto, again, like I've mentioned, the, the city buses. And you buy a pass, validate your pass, and then just come and go as you want. Um, you can buy a pass for a day or for a week. Uh, but make sure you do validate it because they do check to make sure you validated your pass. If you didn't, it's a pretty hefty fine for not having a valid pass to ride. This is St. Mark's Square. Um, Rick Steves has a nice description of it. He says it was decorated in early ransack. <laughs> uh, because all over Europe they borrowed motifs and themes from all over the place to decorate this, this particular basilica. And again, the gondolas and these private canals. Uh, some canals are gondola only, no motorboats. Uh, St. Mark's Square, again, the people. Sometimes in this square the pigeons outnumber the people. Mm -hmm. And if you venture up into the bell tower of St. Mark's, you get views like this, which <coughs> will show you pretty much the whole island of Venice. With all red roofs. With all the red clay roofs, yes. Oh. Um, this is the bell tower. Uh, it's in St. Mark's Square, and this was where the only reported death that ever happened in the square occurred. Uh, years ago when they were doing some work on the clock, they forgot to turn the robots off, and as the hour came about, the robots swung back to strike the hour and knocked one of the workmen off the tower. And you'll find churches, just like in Rome, pretty much everywhere. Um, they they plop them in in some of the tiniest spaces, but pretty much everywhere you see a dome is a church. Again, another busy day on the Grand Same Canal. Mm -hmm. And there's St. Mark's Square on early morning, but the pigeons, of course, there are outnumbering the tourists. And as the sun sets, you really start to see the colors that come out in the, the, the sides of these Venice buildings. Most of them are all stucco, uh, but it really just turns into just one of those things that you won't forget. And if you take a camera, whether it be film or digital, take lots of pictures. I mean, you spend a lot of money to get there, bring home some memories so that you can travel there anytime you wish to. And that's the last picture we have in this series, just... Well, again, you pros. <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful story, and, and I know our viewers, they so appreciate having uh, that travel with the visuals in your, in your narration. Uh, with that, we'll turn to Janelle Burke. Andy and Roxanne, uh, and, let, and let's start with you, Andy. Uh, um, you ha did some studying before you left, read some books and so forth. What would you recommend for people if they wanted to do some reading before they go on a trip like this? Well, the first thing is visit your local bookstore um, and, and go into the travel section. And it'll, it'll be broken out by the country you plan to visit. But if you look through the titles that are there, you're going to find some very specific books on the regions you're going to visit. Um, you'll find books strictly on Rome. You'll find books that are pretty generic and cover Italy from north to south. Uh, but go through the books. Find books that are easy reads for you. Um, there are, are several travel authors out there. Rick Steves being one of them has put out a, a very large series of books that covers countries all over the world and breaks them out by specific trips. Uh, but if you go through the books, find them that are easy to read and that has the information you're looking for. Uh, some books just talk about hotel accommodations. Other books talk about the whole gambit from what you should pack, what the weather's going to be like, what the museum hours are, and different not so much hotel rooms, but private rooms that you can call and make reservations in before you leave. And Roxanne, do you have some tips for us about uh, uh, travel books or how to go about um, taking them with you? Yeah, one of my favorite was <coughs> Rick Steves' books just because he's traveled there so much that he gives you good hints and you know gives you some things that can save you time and money. Um, but he even, in one of his books, you know, describes other books that you can look at. So it, you kind of got to go through them and see what goes to your taste. Um, like Rick Steve had said, he goes, you know, you're doing, what, a $3,000 trip or whatever. You only have a $25 book. Tear it apart. Take pieces with you so you can pack lighter. 
and you know and, and enjoy your trip and it's it was fun to read through things we did a lot of reading through his books before we went just so we had some ideas and then right before we got to a town we'd kind of look up it and see okay what kind of things do we want to do because there's lots of things from restaurants to hotels and in different price ranges so it can fit your needs and Andy I think you have a quote that you want to be sure that people understand that Rick Steves says about traveling All right, Rick, Rick Steves says it best um, in a lecture that we got to see him give over at the Mac in Spokane um, he tells us that, and, and it, it's true, we travel for our own education to learn more about the world around us. But he says, keep one thing in mind when you travel. You are ambassadors of your country. There may be only one or two of you traveling, but in other countries, people judge all Americans by your appearance and your actions. So when you're in the country, be considerate of that. I mean, we're typically a loud society. In Europe, they're a very quiet society, especially if you're having a meal, and you'll find that the locals whisper and the tourists don't. And so if you kind of keep that in mind and do your best to fit in with their society, eat the way they do, talk the way they do, that their impression of Americans overall will be much different than what they presently have. Just don't be loud. Just yeah. don't be loud. Among other things. Be courteous. <laughs> and kind. Yes. Uh, and appreciative. Yes. Uh, Arna Reinhardt. I'm assuming that you did a little shopping while you were there, so I want to ask you, what both of you, what treasures you brought home from your trip? And I'll start with Roxanne. Well, when we were at the Vatican, um, we ended up in the Vatican our, uh, gift shop. Uh, we ended up Which buying. Is on the roof. Yeah, we ended up buying a Piata, and we had it shipped back. That got a little expensive. Shipping is well. For instance, postcards that we did, because those are kind of souvenirs. But you buy a postcard. Well, that's eighty cents for a stamp to get it back to the United States. So, you know, and if it takes a dollar thirty of ours to their dollar, pretty soon, you know, you have fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty dollars in postcards. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we, that was one of them. And then uh, uh, in Tuscany, we picked up a couple bottles of wine and, mm -hmm. you know, and then, uh, I can't remember if we really got anything in Venice, I guess not, but. Oh, we bought some Venetian glass. Uh, in yeah. Venice, there's the uh, Murano glass is the most famous Italian glass that you can have, and and it's scattered through all all throughout Venice because that is the artisan city of of Italy. Um, if you look around, you'll find all kinds of treasures. We bought a few wine bottle stoppers to go with the wine we bought in, in Tuscany. Um, we bought a few little trinkets for some of our guests here at home. Uh, of course, we bought some gold off the Ponte Vecchio Bridge in, in Florence because that's where the best prices are. Um, we also looked at, you know, we bought a few tour guide books. I shouldn't say tour guide books, but, but souvenir books. Because a lot of the places we go into, you can't take pictures. Um, they actually have signs that say no pictures allowed. And so if you go spend, again, another 4 to $5 and buy this book, you're going to have sanctioned pictures that were taken by the government or by the, the museum itself. And they're much better than you can possibly take with your camera. Uh, and they're nice, big, glossy pictures to help you remember some of the sites that you visited. So it's worth spending that extra money to bring that book. But you don't necessarily have to pack it home. You can mail it. Just be prepared that they don't take credit card or debit card at the post office. It's cash only. So <laughs> keep that in mind because we learned that lesson the hard way. Well, one of the other lessons we learned, too, when we were in Tuscany, when you're in smaller towns, oh, yes. if you're going to draw money out, it's better to draw it out in a bigger city and have it with you then, because some of the smaller towns you go to use your card and, and their ATM is out of money. And mm -hmm. we had that happen in Assisi and, and I think Cortona we couldn't get. And so we were starting to panic a little bit because we didn't have cash on us. And, you know, I mean, in some places you go, they don't take credit cards. You know, like at the convent we stayed at, they needed cash only. So, uh, so that's something we learned because we had even called our bank. We called all the way back, you know, because we were panicked and like, did something happen? And they said, no, the transactions are good. You just stick to bigger towns when you're drawing your money out. Something that's come through on both these programs that's so clear to me is, that, and you're talking about the architecture and you were talking about uh, not building new homes. Aren't the Italians, and they're not the only ones that's all over Europe, but through the preservation, historical preservation of the buildings and their art and all. I guess I have a two-part question. The first one is, aren't they much greater students of their history than we are? Of course, their, their civilization is much older than uh, when Europeans came here. Of course, Native Americans have been here a very long time and 
have great history. Uh, did that, that comes through, doesn't it, in these programs? I, I think so. I mean, as, as you look at, at what these, uh, the, the locals, how they treat their local areas, mm -hmm. um, how they really relish their communities. I mean, they've got the local markets, they've got everything within walking distance of their homes. Um, unlike here in these states where we get in a car and drive five miles to go, go to the grocery store, they walk five blocks. Um, that right there is indicative of the culture they're trying to hang on to, um, the history of the buildings that and are still standing. They maintain their buildings. Yeah, we, don't, we, we tear them down in the United States. <coughs> they restore them and keep them up. And I think that right there, as they see these older buildings, they understand the history where they came from. They know the Roman history behind how this country came to be. Isn't there another history here too when you talk about they walk many places and it's close by? Uh, we've been so wealthy and will continue to be in resources, but they have to depend on other countries a lot for their energy, you know, petroleum and all. So they're much more um, conserving in their attitudes, would it not be? Yes, well, and for instance, that car that we rented, um, you know, it, it was kind of a sportsy little car. And I thought, oh no, we're never going to be able to afford to drive around because we're going to have a lot of gas money because gas is uh, more expensive there than what we're used to. All over Europe. Yes, mm -hmm. all over Europe. And so, I was very surprised when in the car it tells you the mileage and it, or kilometers and, and tells you what you're getting per liter. And so we did the conversion. We were getting 60 miles to the gallon with this little sports car. It was a diesel. We didn't smell the diesel. You didn't couldn't even hear it. Hear it. Um, once in a while I'd catch a whiff of it. And so driving all over Tuscany, I mean, we only used, I think it took us 20 euros to fill back up before back we up. took it back in. I thought we were going to be spending like 200, 300 American dollars in gas, and so I was very pleased and would hope that we can get to that point here someday where our cars will get 60 miles to the gallon. A lesson to be learned. Yes. <laughs> there are many lessons for us all to learn. Thank you both, uh, uh, Roxanne and Andy. It's been a pleasure having you here for two weeks. I know the panel joins me in saying, mm -hmm. what a great trip, and thanks for sharing it with our viewers uh, like they've gone along with you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed the programs the last two weeks as much as we've enjoyed bringing them to you. And we invite you to be with us again next week where we're going to continue uh, a travelogue with a new guest in uh, South America. Uh, and I hope you'll be there. I, and I just think that you do. And I hope you enjoy these travels with us. Until then, I want to say to you all that uh, I hope you have a good week. And please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music